Welcome to the panel on how do culture and gender affect depression. My name is Millie Torado and I'm one of the psychologists at Counseling and Psychological Services. Uh, CAPS is the counseling center here on campus for our approximately 37,000 students. I began my graduate studies in the 70s at the then Eurocentric Columbia University a situation which we know no longer exists because now that Leo, Lee Bollinger is there, he's, he's doing what we trained him to do at Michigan. Uh, at that time, it was quite a challenge for me as a Puerto Rican female raised in New York City to reconcile and to adapt mainstream theory and clinical practice uh, with what I was experiencing in my own Puerto Rican community and in other communities of color in New York. There has been much growth in the last 30 years as we explore the occurrence and the manifestation of depression in women, in African Americans, in Asian and Asian Pacific Islanders, in Latinos, Latinas, in Native Americans, in non-heterosexual communities, and in members of the international community. The video presented to us yesterday morning, the view from here eloquently spoke to this reality. We are very fortunate to have today a wonderful panel of researchers and clinicians who will address these issues. Following the introduction of the panel members, we invite each of them to make a brief statement on this topic. And after that, we will open the forum to questions from you, the audience. I will introduce them in the order in which they're seated. To my immediate right is Dr. Jonathan Metzel, and I like to call him Dr. Doctor, because he went through the torture of an MD degree and a PhD degree. Uh, he's a Stanford trained psychiatrist, has a PhD in American Studies from the University of Michigan. He is an assistant professor of psychiatry and also teaches in our Women's Studies program and has been um, very, very involved in the work there. He's also a senior attending physician in the adult psychiatric clinic and teaches courses in the area of history, psychiatry, and gender. Uh, he has written copiously and his book, Prozac on the Couch, Prescribing Gender in the Era of Wonder Drugs, will be published in April uh, by Duke University Press. So that will be available to you. So that's Dr. Metzel. Uh, sitting right next to him is Dr. Doria Meir. Dr. Deer's degree is from Wright State University and she is a postdoctoral fellow at Counseling and Psychological Services. Um, and I have the great honor of being one of her supervisors, but I think I'm learning a whole lot more than she's learning from me. Uh, before beginning her doctoral studies, she worked as a lecturer in Bangladesh, where she established the first counseling center in the history of that country. Her work has focused on the history of uh, diversity, violence against women, especially South Asian women, multicultural issues, and providing services to community of color and international students. She has spent almost 10 years of her life in the USA and in Canada and can speak eloquently to those experiences. Right next to her is Dr. Harold Woody Neighbors known to all his friends as Woody. He received his PhD in social community psychology from the University of Michigan in 1982. He is currently a social professor and associate director for research training in the Center for Research on Ethnicity, Culture, and Health uh, in the School of Public Health here. He's also the associate director of the program on the research for black Americans uh, that a number of you might have heard about and read about, uh, which comes out of our Institute of Social Research. And there he leads the program's mental health work group. And I have been able to follow his career from the time he was a very young grad student um, when I arrived in Ann Arbor in 79. And he continues to grow and get wiser and wiser. And I just continue to get dumber and dumber, so go figure. <laughs> Maybe it's the effect of Ann Arbor on a transplant to Puerto Rican. <laughs> Next to him is Dr. Susan Nolan-Hoxma. 
She's a professor of psychology and psychiatry here at Michigan. She received uh, her BA in psychology from Yale and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Her research has focused on emotion regulation and adaptation to stress and in gender differences in this regulation. Uh, she has won numerous, numerous awards, among them the uh, David Shako Early Career Award from APA, Leadership Awards from APA, and um, NIMH Awards. Um, one of her books, Coping with Loss, Sex Differences and Depression, and Women Who Think Too Much, uh, is available at our local bookstores. And as a matter of fact, last night, ever, after having a wonderful Puerto Rican meal, I was reading through the Ann Arbor News, and I saw a brief write-up on women who think too much. So see, even our august Ann Arbor News is aware of her work. Um, immediately next to her is Dr. Stacy Pearson. Dr. Pearson is another psychologist at Counseling and Psychological Services. Her PhD is from Pennsylvania State University. She has worked with college students in many different campuses, including um, Pennsylvania State, University of Florida, and of course here at Michigan. She specializes in issues related to women of color, eating disorders, and mood disorders. She has been the recipient of several early career awards for both APA and ACPA. She is also the clinical director of Turning Point Counseling, which is a community faith-based counseling center organized by one of the black churches here in Washtenaw County. Right next to her is Dr. Daniel Pack. Uh, he is an Asian American psychiatrist. I affectionately call him Pac-Man because of his voracious intellectual appetite. Uh, he is currently a faculty member in the psych department with a program for intergroup relations. Uh, his work has focused on depression, on drinking behaviors and suicides among Asian Pacific American and international students. Uh, he has special interest in the role of culture and ethnicity in understanding and in the treatment of depression in our global community. He also wants me to tell you that he's married and the proud father of three children. Um, and some of these folks, I have warned them, they're getting maybe two to three minutes and that's it, because I'm quite a taskmaster, those of you that know me. So just fair warning. <laughs> and of course, the last member of the panel, um, is um, Mary Nana Emma Danqua, uh, who has moved us eloquently this afternoon, um, and don't need to introduce her anymore. So at this point, I think we'll we'll proceed. You all can decide in what way you want to present. I believe Dr. Pack, you would like to present first. All right. So when you see me doing the timeout notion, <laughs> I mean business. <laughs> It's really been business for me that uh, I don't get to let me manage to come and talk to you. I used to call me sick of that, my man, talk of that, a lot of different things, but anything's uh, okay. Um, we're going to briefly, within three minutes, talk about diversity and depression, uh, story, <laughs> tell another story, and also tell about culture, how culture could powerfully affect uh, depression in all these uh, spaces. Uh, first, just a little story. Uh, you know, I've been in this country, United States, for over 30 years now. And uh, I met my wife, who's an international student here at the University of Michigan. She just came from Asia uh, studying here. And uh, we decided to get married. Uh, and I proposed on my first date. Uh, and we decided to get married. We got married. I was thinking that she is very subservient, submissive, Asian woman. <laughs> and my wife, and I was, since I've been here over 30 years, I'll be a gentleman, I'll wash dishes, change the diapers, clean the house, and share all the chores. But once we got there, we looked at each other and said, you fool me. <laughs> And there's culture at work, even in marriage, and in depression, more so in depression and mental health, I believe. Just a, this is 2000 University of Michigan freshman profiles, and just looking at the diversity of students, it's overwhelming. Uh, 
13%, are Asian Americans, 5% uh, are Hispanic Americans, 62% Caucasian Americans, uh, nine, over 9% African Americans, uh, and less than 1% Native American. This is significantly improved since 1990 uh, data. And international students, 4% is a freshman, but for University of Michigan as a whole, there's 11% of international students. Mm -hmm. um, just a brief, uh, the diversity is here in campus, and this is true for most of the campuses, I believe. Especially for Asian Americans, they make up majority of the minorities, uh, minority student population, many of the uh, universities. I want to talk specifically on Asians, uh, uh, students of Asian descent in this country. I, I know a friend, very close a uh, person, uh, who went through a psychiatric residency program. He was a, uh, he, he had a heart, Asian American uh, student uh, resident who really wanted to become a psychiatrist. Uh, went to University of Michigan psychiatric uh, uh, program, residency program, and uh, he went through it. He had several episodes of depression, very severe depression. Uh, sometimes he became very suicidal, uh, was severely depressed, he was not performing well. Uh, often he went into hospital with stomach pains. Mm -hmm. At one point he had an appendectomy done, but they found out that his appendix was absolutely normal. Mm -hmm. And this uh, person went through, a, but no one, no this person ever admitted that he was depressed. He was going through a depressive episode. Uh, unfortunately, the psychiatric system did not recognize that this person was depressed. Uh, and that is what I want to talk about. And that person, by the way, is a very intimate person that I know. It's me. Uh, I didn't know that I was going through this severe depression in this uh, uh, psychiatric residency program. Uh, although I was going through psychiatry, I wanted to become a psychiatrist. I just want to illustrate how powerful culture plays in the way we view depression and how it plays out in one's life. And for me, although I wanted to be a psychiatrist, I had complete denial of my own depression. Fortunately, I did receive therapy, I did receive treatment, and I am doing well. Thank you. Uh, but what I want to also say is that the system and the institution in psychiatry did not recognize that this person was severely depressed. Uh, his presentation was very different than the uh, average American presentation about depression. Uh, it was very different. So I want to just focus on what are some of the differences. This is a Asian American perspective. You know, Asian, we live in historical time, American. By the way, this is what I did. Uh, I wrote this in my personal statement to the University of Michigan Psychiatry <laughs> Program when I applied as part of my personal statement. And as an Asian, I felt like my identity is we. My family, my country, my extended family. As an American, I felt like it's me, I. As an Asian, I felt like I am very passive. As an American, I felt very aggressive and assertive. As an American, I, as an Asian, I wanted to accept the world just the way that I didn't want to change anything. As an American, I wanted to change the world. As an Asian, I contemplate a lot. As an American, I act by no one thing. I want to act on it. As an Asian, I communicate very indirectly. As an American, I communicate directly. <laughs> She's communicating directly to me. <laughs> As an Asian, we believe in freedom of silence. As an American, I believe in freedom of speech. As an Asian, I marry first, then love. As an American, I love first, then marry. This, I think, I was more Asian because I married on my first day I proposed, which is very unusual. And this is just a sampling how different our orientation is and how this can play out in our depression 
uh, both in stigma, diagnosis, and treatment. And as we discuss culture, uh, depression, and gender, I just thought this might be a good way to introduce the concept of culture, how different, how powerful this can have, impact this can have on, the, on depression. Uh, as an Asian, I will exercise my freedom of silence at this time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Pearson. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's <laughs> totally appropriate. There you go. Um, and I will do my best to um, be obedient to Dr. Toronto and not harm him. Although I mentioned her earlier, I could probably talk about this for about three hours or so before I can rush out. She is my best neighbor in her office, and so I have to live with her. Um, so I will act right as the kids say. At the heart of African American culture, when I think about the impact of culture and one mood disorder, particularly depression, at the heart of African American culture is connectedness. Connectedness to nature, connectedness to your city family, connectedness to your family, connectedness to your friend, connectedness to uh, your spiritual uh, identity of those relationships, connected, connectedness to your creative flair or your personality. Connected to connectedness to time. And at the heart of our culture is connectedness. Now when you put that connectedness next to the overlay of this depression, at the heart of depression is disconnectedness. Disconnectedness to hope. I feel disconnected from hope. I feel hopeless. I mean certainly there is sleep and energy and guilt and concentration and appetite and the ability to feel uh, pleasure and suicidality and all those things are important, but certainly at the heart of those things is feeling disconnected. Dis disconnected from one's feelings, and feelings are actually too overwhelming to feel them. Disconnectedness from one's body, I can't see. I'm eating too much, I'm eating too little. Disconnectedness, uh, maybe even in the sense of somatic symptoms, that my stomach may hurt, or I may have a headache, uh, but I know it's about something else, but I'm not necessarily able to connect those things, if you will. Depression can often lead our African American students here on campus to feel disconnected and out of sync with the connectedness of the cultural value. And this, as you might imagine, can be very disconcerting to people. And what I believe the work of both us as therapists as well as just servants to the communities that we serve is to help the people be get back in sync with their cultural values and that connect. Now certainly there are external variables that play a role in depression, yes? We think about the trauma of racism, and I do mean trauma. And, and, and oftentimes there's almost a PTSD-like reaction mm -hmm. to racism. I think most recently, um, as the affirmative action cases got kicked up and Bush let us know that our policy was fundamentally flawed, yes, the media came <laughs> on campus, our students began to experience trauma around racism. Things got kicked up in the classroom for them, with their, with their colleagues. There was always somebody with a mic sticking in, in their face wanting to know how they felt. But what they felt was disconnected and traumatized by this thing playing out on our campus, which led some of them to retreat and feel depressed. Other external variables that can play a role in both the disconnectedness and, and their body uh, depression is oftentimes uh, a lot of our American students here on our campus and other campuses that I've been to as well are what we call the hope of a family. That they're still first generation, which continues to blow my mind. But when you think about the culture itself being interdependent, and they may be the first one to come to college. They're not only going to college for themselves, but they're going to college for sometimes their entire family, their entire community, their entire block. And that in of itself, that pressure can lead to depression. Okay. Um, so, and, 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 the, and the last thing, and, I, and I'll just stop here, and maybe we'll get to some, some solutions um, in the Q&A period is uh, racial identity also playing a role in uh, mood disorders and depression particularly. And, and when I say racial identity development, I'm talking about the idea that an individual works from idealizing whiteness 
to idealizing blackness to being someplace in between. And, and that process in and of itself, if someone gets stuck at any point in that process, can also lead to disconnectedness and thereby leading to depression. I have some suggested my solutions, but I'll stop and make room for one of the comments on the panel. Thank you. Dr. Susan Nolan Hudson. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've actually been asked to talk a bit about gender expression, which is um, what I specialize in. And uh, as many of you may know, there's a very large gender difference in depression. Mm -hmm. Namely, women are twice as likely as men to become depressed. Uh, this has been shown in dozens of epidemiological studies uh, all over the United States and in many different countries of the world. It's a very robust finding. And when I talk about this, um, people often uh, have their uh, sort of pet answers to this. They'll say, well, of course it's because of, and then they'll whip out one answer. But one of the things that is coming across in, in three more minutes here is uh, how multi-determined the gender conditions of depression. In fact, I welcome that is one of the most overdetermined phenomena um, in psychology, psychology, namely there are too many reasons why women are more prone to depression than men. Um, and I just want to highlight sort of three categories of reasons that I think there's very strong empirical evidence to support. Um, one is, um, first and foremost, I'll put at the top of this, it has to do with stress, and in particular major trauma stressors. Um, I would argue that probably the single biggest contributor that we know of right now to women's high rates of depression is sexual abuse. Um, mm -hmm. There's really good evidence for this that it contributes mm -hmm. to a big chunk of the difference in rates of depression between men and women. That's not to say that all women who are depressed have been sexually abused, but that um, it's, a, it's a very large contributor. Um, people often want to argue that it's biological, and that biology probably does play a role. And here, the research we're, we're still working on it. Um, and in fact, the single most common response I get when I talk about women in depression is, well, it's hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, and hormones probably do play a role in a much more complex way than we often think. But there's, there's good evidence that hormonal changes that occur, for example, in puberty and in the postpartum, may trigger certain changes in brain neurochemistry that um, contributes to depression. Um, genetics may play a role, it's not clear here. I mean, genetics definitely plays a role in depression. Whether it plays a role in more women or more prone to depression is a little bit less clear, but there's some kind of evidence that that may be the case. And then, um, in terms of psychological variables, I just want to highlight two. One is, uh, and was referred to by a former Michigan professor, Ron Kessler, as the cost of care. Um, women are very strongly emotional and this provides us with tremendous richness um, in our mm -hmm. lives. Uh, it also gives us more people to be depressed about. Mm -hmm. And there's some reason to believe that women's connectedness with other people um, is one of the risk factors for depression because we are more likely to feel symptoms of depression when horrible things happen to other people. Um, and because um, women often get their own self-esteem and self-image tied up in their relationships to others to an extent where um, they don't have a, a sense of self that is apart from the relationships with others, and can, that can make them very vulnerable. And then another psychological variable, which is um, what I've studied a fair amount, and this is the focus of uh, this latest book that mm -hmm. was mentioned, um, is the tendency to get caught in cycles of negative ruminations about the past and the present and the future, and um, <coughs> rather than taking um, action to overcome the sources of one's depression, um, to stay in step in the nation and, and be pulled deeper and deeper into depression. And that seems to be a, something that happens more in women's lives than men. Uh, the good news is that um, all of the psychotherapies and pharmacological therapies um, do help women with depression. And um, uh, the big issue now is um, getting more women into treatment for depression, helping them realize it's not just another person or woman that we have to live with mm -hmm. um, all of the time, but rather that it's, it's a disorder that can be treated and dealt with um, reasonably effectively uh, and that they have the right to heal it. 
Thank you. Dr. Woody Neighbors. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I too am going to try to adhere to the guidelines set forth for uh, Millie, as she's known affectionately uh, to her friends. Uh, what she didn't mention to you is that uh, she and I have uh, simultaneously uh, raised uh, daughters uh, who went through the NR school system and both are doing quite well. Mm -hmm. Really nice to see uh, Millie again. Um, I'm wearing a little bit of different hat than some of the other speakers. Uh, come to you mainly uh, wearing a, a research hat. Mm -hmm. uh, my main appointment is at the Institute for Social Research, and particularly within the Survey Research Center. And we do uh, most of our work on uh, large samples focusing on adults. But um, I, I have come prepared to speak with you about uh, some smaller uh, qualitative studies that we've done where we've actually had uh, some students in our samples, and I hope we'll have time mm -hmm. to have a Q&A about uh, some of that work because uh, we've really got some very interesting uh, results. Um, I guess the other thing I, I want to say is that, you know, coming at this from the research perspective, and particularly from a, a survey perspective, means that a lot of what we're trying to do uh, deals with the implementation of the DSM criteria. You know, we have a lot of uh, mention and discussion about diagnosis, and I want to stress the fact that we are uh, trying to implement those criteria in at least two settings. One in the community, and, and you actually heard mention of uh, Ron Kessler, who I was fortunate enough to, to work with while he was here uh, at the University of Michigan. But uh, being a survey researcher, that means um, I'm involved in epidemiologic work. Mm -hmm. And to break that down, uh, epidemiology is all about counting and measuring. And so we spend a lot of time trying to get a handle on the magnitude of the issue, the magnitude of the problem, uh, from a large perspective. And doing that from an epidemiologic standpoint means trying to implement the DSM criteria, particularly criteria for depression, using community surveys, and I hope uh, to have some time to talk to you about that, because it's not an easy thing to do. Um, the other area where we're trying to implement the criteria uh, is in uh, clinical uh, settings, and there we run directly into the issue of diagnosis. And so a lot of our work not only deals with diagnosis, but this issue of misdiagnosis, which you uh, have heard mentioned today. And that can be a very uh, elusive thing to pin down. Uh, basically, our work focuses in three areas on the epidemiology of it. I got into this work primarily because I was very interested in one fundamental basic question. Who has the higher rates of mental illness, African Americans or whites? Uh, that's what got me into this whole enterprise, and the more I looked into it, the more difficult uh, difficulty I realized it was in answering that question. But our, our basic information from the epidemiologic standpoint indicates that the overall rates of depression for African Americans are lower than they are for other groups. That's something we need to talk about. Uh, the second issue we've been focusing on quite heavily is where people go for help, health seeking behavior. So even though African American rates tend to be lower, among those people who do meet criteria for depression, African Americans are significantly less likely to seek professional help, particularly help within the specialty mental health care sector. And I think that's something we talk about. Uh, finally, when we do seek help, the literature tells us and our work tells us that we're at a little bit higher risk of misdiagnosis. And in our work, uh, the differentiation of schizophrenia from bipolar disorder uh, is, is particularly noteworthy. Mm -hmm. And I think. Um, we could have some interesting discussions about that. The thing that's looming across all three of those areas is this notion of cultural variation. The thing that was emphasized quite heavily in the Surgeon General's uh, supplement to mental health. Uh, I think cultural variation takes a difficult task and makes it even more challenging. And I want to emphasize just how much we are asking from our clinicians when we ask them to be culturally competent. <laughs> Um, I'd like to leave you with one uh, major take-home point for me, and that is uh, my feeling that we really need to put even more emphasis on mental health education. 
But when I say mental health education, I really think the educational interventions need to happen on two fronts. One, with the consumers, and second, maybe even more importantly, with the mental health providers around issues of cultural sensitivity and cultural competence. But I want to emphasize that the mental health education with the mental health providers around cultural issues needs to happen irrespective of the clinician's race. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Duramir. Hi. I have to speak to the team of the time. This is my supervisor. It's a diary for a special meeting. I'm speaking to the time limit. Dr. Pike has already mentioned some of the unique features that pertain to Asians and depression. I'm going to speak from the perspective of uh, South Asian international student to female as well. And um, you know some things that are very unique to South Asians more than some of the other Asian cultures. And each of these uh, different parts of my identity, being South Asian, being an international student when I first came here, and being female, really have different impacts on how depression presents itself. So I'm going to try and uh, um, well, let's all three together and speak as briefly as I can. <laughs> um, for South Asians, the most important, besides the family, the most important aspect of their identity is their religious identity. And the predominant religions in South Asia, Hinduism and Islam, don't believe in mental illness. Mental illness is generally seen as parental failure, family failure. It's seen as a uh, consequence of past sins, the concept of karma, which is very, very ingrained in the Hindu tradition. Um, also seen as um, the failure of the children to be a good son or a good daughter. So in that sense, South Asian women are in a particularly um, strong double bind. South Asian women are supposed to be responsible, a lot of responsibility is um, placed on them to be the good daughter. Many of you know that in South Asia, for a female, there are two dichotomies, a virgin or the whore, and there is no in-between. And to be a virgin, to be a good woman, the essence of a good woman is to be sacrificing, is to suffer. So no South Asian woman who's been raised in her traditional family is going to come and tell you I'm depressed. She's going to present it at more as, you know, in an academic setting, she's going to present it more as an academic failure, as an inability to make friends, as an inability to get along with people, culture shock. These are the ones you're going to hear more than, um, you know, I'm depressed. Um, she may present most of the symptoms of depression, the suicidality, the uh, sleeplessness, the lack of um, appetite, so on and so, on, so on. forth. But when she says that she has a mental illness, she's, become, she's already become less than the perfect woman. And it has major repercussions on her in terms of her family. She's brought dishonor to the family. And I'm stressing more, I'm not saying that this is not true of South Asian men as well, uh, because they're uh, brought up in the same religious and cultural tradition, but it's particularly more uh, salient for women, because they're not supposed to speak up, they're not supposed to speak out. To be a good daughter, a good wife, a good mother, which is the ultimate for a South Asian woman, she has to suffer in silence, which means that if she is depressed, she has to continue being depressed. If she is depressed, it's because she was um, she wasn't a good daughter, or a good wife, or a good mother. She's failed both as an individual as well as in her role in her social and family role. Um, for a South Asian woman, then uh, speaking about any sort of mental illness has repercussions, like I mentioned already, on family honor and family name. She's brought dishonor to the family. It has repercussions in terms of her future, especially marriage. Nobody's going to marry her anymore. Not only that, but nobody's going to marry her brothers and sisters because one of the daughters had a mental illness. So she carries the burden of the family 
in how well the family does on her shoulders, in a sense. Uh, also, by saying that she's depressed, she's now lost standing in society among her friends, among her peers, among you know, the extended family, relatives. Um, and more, most importantly, I think, for the South Asian people, she's lost standing as a person of a particular religion. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. I really, I really apologize that it feels like we're galloping through this incredibly deep uh, area. Here's Dr. Jonathan Metzl.
Now, in the late 60s and early 1970s, it's a notion of mom is a kind of 50s notion that I was just talking about, a very kind of domestic, stay-at-home kind of mother, uh, shifted because in the 1970s we had the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, other, other movements that kind of tried to debunk this authority of, 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 of the notion of masculinity that was a play in the 1970s, specifically with the notion that women didn't need men, that women uh, were kind of overthrowing the patriarchal authority or didn't need here to the norms of motherhood at the time. And at that same time, you see a whole host of ads, like this one from the American Journal of Psychiatry, that talk about mental illness quite literally as 35 and single. There's really, I mean, I look at this ad, and the first time I saw it, I noticed that it tells this narrative of Jan through her kind of long history of unsuccessful relationships until in the end she comes to a psychiatrist's office. But the amazing point about this ad, the number one in psychiatric journal in the country, was that single was presented at the disease, as a disease. If you don't believe this point, look what happened three months later when the ad reappears. Uh, and you can see that somebody at the ad agency figured out that they had to apply something that had to do with more than just kind of the social role of mothers and motherhood. So they added this word psychoneurotic. At the same time, you know, as kind of intelligent viewers, we can see that nothing else changed whatsoever in the ad. Uh, and you see this again in a lot of ads of the same time period, where single, threatening, domineering men, women, always without men, kind of uh, feminist women, by kind of of the popular culture at the time were presented as being in need of psychiatric implementation. Now, as I mentioned in the present day, and I'll conclude with this, I think that the, the answer, the, the questions raised by these kind of cultural representations are, are really rather difficult because contemporary ads, like ads in, in past times, don't really shock us uh, with its new social uh, movements or social trends. What they do is they show us things that are comfortable and familiar to us, and then try to link those with indications for medication. And on one hand, cultural stereotypes govern the way that we think about ourselves in the world, and they're very important in terms of the expression of symptoms and communication between doctor and patient. And at the same time, they play into a host of stereotypes that in looking back and then in thinking about our present moment, uh, could be seen as kind of uh, being rendered problematic. And so the message that I promote in my work is that doctors and patients need to be informed, really self-aware and aware during their conversation of these assumptions so that whether or not medication is prescribed, uh, they can you know, they mm -hmm. can become knowledgeable about the kind of currencies that they're talking about and what is being represented and what, what is being left out of their conversation. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're left with about five minutes in which to entertain some questions. And again, we all apologize. But we know you're very resourceful. You can get email addresses of all these people and bombard them with your questions. Question over here. So we're at a conference on depression and college campuses, and I have a very basic question. Why is it that college students are not getting What can those of us who interact with students from three to nine months, so students from different cultures, what can we best do? And to educate domestic, uh, domestic students to interact with them and also to educate domestic students. Panel? Yeah, I, would say, I would just say two things. Is that on? Um, one is understand my own cultural orientation. Is it on? I wonder if it's not on. Okay. Is it on now? I would say two things. One is I think we need to understand my own cultural orientation uh, from which I'm looking through to understand the patient or the client. And the second is to understand where that person, that client is coming from with all this uh, background and ethnicity and culture and their history. And understand to me means uh, you know, kind of standing under that person, uh, not over it, trying to figure out what's going on, but trying to stand under that person. Uh, that's what you know, 30 seconds less. <laughs> if I could also speak briefly to that question. Uh, I close my remarks by uh, emphasizing I think one of the main interventions we need to do is in the educational realm. And, and your question really speaks more on the side of uh, the consumers, or the potential consumers. And our work uh, clearly shows, I'm going to speak now to uh, African Americans 
And what I'm about to say is uh, maybe triple for African American males. Mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt, in my mind, uh, one of the biggest barriers to getting the help that we not only need but deserve. It's all right to get the treatment that's out there. But uh, from the consumer side, uh, there's a psychological barrier in the African American community, and it has to do with this issue of strength. Mm -hmm. uh, in our work, and this is confirmed by national uh, studies of attitudes, um, depression, well, the good news is that among African Americans of all the DSM disorders, depression seems to be the one uh, with which we are most familiar. So there's an opening there. Uh, I think we are ready to accept this radical idea that uh, personal uh, symptoms of distress can be viewed as a disease that is amenable to treatment. Um, but we do see it as a reflection of personal weakness. And our studies show clearly that there's a tremendous reluctance to reveal that to anyone. And so my recommendation would be that if there's some way for in small group discussions to uh, get people to uh, move past that psychological barrier, and, and there, there are a number of strategies that we might want to use, but I don't have time to really go into that. But I, but I think uh, if we can figure out a way to, to, to mount the interventions that way, then we at least have a chance to get people into the help that they deserve. And I think there's some reasons why many black folks are afraid to get help. I mentioned the misdiagnosis issue. So, I mean, th there's some real barriers on both sides. I better stop by. If I, I just want to piggyback on this for a quick second. I think the other piece is to honor the cultural mistrust and to not pathologize it, to actually normalize it, you know, that um, it's okay that it doesn't feel good to you that you might need to connect with a mental health professional, that that's pretty typical for a student of color. And uh, my experience has been in me to tell a little wise tale that I once took the student over to the counseling center and blah, 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 and it turned out so wonderfully terrific. I think another good thing is to, to really build good bridges with the mental health professionals on your various campuses. Some of the strongest and best referrals come from my connections with people outside of the counseling center who are able to walk a student over, sit in the lobby and say, oh, my Patricia, she's so wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And I am, but, but, <laughs> but, but what's good is that I have a halo effect uh, and that that kind of takes place and makes the referral a good charm. And the student is uh, oftentimes able to stick and stay as a result of the big bridge that, sh that she and I, are, or the other person and I, have built, whether that be an academic counselor, a residence hall person, or a cafeteria worker, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just add to that. I, I, I agree very much that it's important to be self aware and to be respectful of every kind of difference, and at the same time to realize that uh, relationships take over their own complexity over time. And so, I, you know, I have quite a few examples of somebody who wants to see a male psychiatrist or a Jewish psychiatrist, and they look at very good four or five sessions into it. They're like, you're not the kind of male Jewish psychiatrist. <laughs> so it's important to create an avenue of expression where you can say, well, what were your, what were your expectations? What were you, what were you thinking? And kind of get to get that on the table as much as possible. Question in this corner. Yes, um, I wonder, in a community like Detroit, how uh, much is the church a barrier to people seeking help for uh, psychological mm -hmm. The question is, I wonder, in a community like Detroit, how much is the church a barrier for people to seek help? Did I praise that? Uh, okay. <laughs> and, and of course, I, I think it depends on the culture of the church. Um, I mean, what's true is that psychology has not been very kind to the church, and the church has not been very kind <coughs> certainly to psychology. And so the two uh, historically have made very unlikely bedfellows, if you will. But what's true is if you can uh, 
get in contact with the indigenous healers or the spiritual leaders of the community and do some psychoeducation or, or just um, helping them to understand what the process is like or even bringing them into the work that you're doing with them, helping them again to connect. You connecting with them and you and them, them in turn helping you to connect to the person who needs services, it, it, it might work. But certainly there has been a historical contentious relationship. But I mean, I, I think in, in my introduction, Dr. Travada said, I run a faith-based counseling center out of a black church. So it can work. Mm -hmm. I just briefly mm -hmm. add to that, that um, in my opinion, the, the uh, African American church would be one of the first places that I would go to look for uh, an organizational setting where we can really make a difference. Uh, our research clearly shows that while we uh, are very, very reluctant to seek uh, specialty mental health care, uh, for when we're extremely stressed, uh, we're using, we're, we're seeking help from ministers and pastors at about the same rate as we're seeking help from our primary care physicians. Uh, but I would agree, the relationship it's pretty dicey, and it goes both ways. Uh, some ministers are extremely reluctant to make any type of referral, and I think primarily the mental health establishment has been somewhat arrogant in its opinion that uh, you need to send folks to me, and that's not necessarily the case. But uh, I've also talked to, to African-American African -American ministers who have said point blank, uh, there's a point at which the kinds of problems I'm trying to help folks with are beyond my uh, realm of expertise in the sense that they are extremely serious and I would like to make a link. You know, I would just broaden that question to not just church, but religion uh, in general. Uh, particularly because I think ethnic groups, they attend the religious uh, uh, churches or uh, their religion, uh, somewhere around 60 to 70 percent plays a key role in uh, psychoeducation as well as mental health treatment. And from the other side, is I think as a health professional, we need to understand that side, where they're coming from. Religion plays a significant role in people's lives. We can't neglect that and say, this is it. Uh, so I think there's a balance on both sides. We need to come together in a more synthetic uh, approach. Mm -hmm. More outreach from both sides. The comment was more outreach from both sides. Um, I'm sorry, I think we're going to have to stop here, I believe. Um, I'm looking to see if there's someone from the uh, coordinating committee who could give me a green light here. Oh, yeah. here's Dean Lewis Gray. Yes, I think a couple more questions. Okay. Um, rather, let's go way to the, someone who we haven't heard from yet, from uh, Siena Heights, is that? No, no, you, the lady with the gray. Uh, <laughs> I, I would just like to ask Dr. Pax, how is who would find to make the diagnosis and how does it change? Who finally made your diagnosis and how does it change? That's a great question. <laughs> no one made the diagnosis. Uh, um, no one made the diagnosis, but it was just collectively assumed that I was depressed. But without labeling me that I'm depressed, if you heard her saying that uh, that label has a significant ramification, a ramification in the family, in their future, in their history, in the future of their family. So no one made the diagnosis, but I was treated uh, despite that. Uh, within certain cultural understanding and with a certain uh, sensitivity with, with those issues. And so I went to treatment without saying that I'm going to treatment. And that person treated me without saying I'm treating you. <laughs> you, you, you can understand that. But I'm doing very well. My wife and I are doing just fine. Great. <laughs> One more question, Dean Willis? I'm not asking questions. No, not Dean Willis. What is the significance of any uh, therapists sharing the same culture with the client of patients? <laughs> Um, I think it does a little bit work because, uh, especially speaking about the salvation culture, sometimes the salvation student doesn't want to see me because there's that fear, what if you know somebody that my family knows? So I don't think it's right to just assume that just because a student is of a 
particular Asian uh, or South Asian culture that you should always match. Especially where I'm from, Bangladesh is a very, very small community. And it's highly likely that I know or know of somebody from that person's family. So um, I think we'd be doing, uh, doing the student an injustice to just assume that they want to see somebody of their own ethnicity or religion for that matter. I'd like to make two, two quick points in response to that. Uh, number one, our search on uh, diagnosis and misdiagnosis within uh, hospital settings shows that to the extent that we can really pin down this issue of misdiagnosis, uh, the, the, the misclassification is there for both African American and non-African American clinicians. So at least one part of the evidence is that it, in, in this particular work, it, it didn't seem to make a difference in how we were uh, analyzing the, day, the second thing I would say, when we do, uh, when we've run focus groups with African American clinicians, to our surprise, the African American clinicians indicated to us that being of the same race or skin color, or skin color as the client is sometimes a barrier. Clients tend to say, say things like, oh, you know what I mean. There's an assumption of a shared understanding and the clinicians are saying, no, not really. I'm not sure. I don't know you need to elaborate. And we were uh, quite surprised by that phone. I want to just add to that. I think it's absolutely correct that also I think our um, my experience as a, uh, as a consumer, <laughs> but uh, my experience has told me that race, ethnicity, and culture are often used synonymously, and they're really not. And particularly for someone, as a black woman, a lot of people sometimes believe that they know my background when really they don't. <laughs> and um, also, when you sort of expand it and look at the whole, as I said, I'm an immigrant from Ghana, first generation. When you look at first generation immigrants and second generation immigrants and third, and the way that culture sort of plays out in that, the way that people sort of assimilate into um, the American culture, where they juggle their home, their allegiance to their home culture, and their desire to sort of integrate into American culture, all of those, all of those are very important particularly when you're talking about depression, and yet all we see is the face, and then we make assumptions based on just the outward experience of that person. So I think sometimes it's not, it's not always beneficial to be with someone who thinks they know, or thinks that they share something in common with you. What the also indicates is that um, Racial ethnic matching sometimes does work, but in, in the context of um, that it reduces the likelihood of premature termination. And so, uh, so, so the student call may be more likely to stay with a therapist who is from the same cultural or ethnic group than they would be with a white therapist, but it doesn't directly impact outcomes. And so the outcomes are the same. And so as, as a Caucasian person, um, a student, if, if that student can connect with you, or a patient can connect with you, the outcomes will be the same as they would be with somebody from the same racial or cultural group. And that's part of why it's so important for all of us, not just permission to come, but all of us to be culturally competent. That we can't kind of stand behind the veil and say, well, they do racial ethnic management, I may not be part of the pool. But what's true is that if, if you are culturally competent, the outcomes will be the same. You know, one, one thing that's apparent is a number of our panelists are from uh, communities where there's an oral tradition and it's very hard to pull the plug on that. <laughs> this concludes the work of the panel and I invite you to applaud their work. It's such wonderful, so beautiful people. Thank you very much.